on this Wednesday night, BC port strike drama. Why workers have again ditched the picket lines. My patient says run up. Yeah, baby. The pressure the feds face to end the dispute. Russia's revenge for a bridge attack. The new strikes pummeling Ukraine. High tech help. How AI could aid in diagnosing Alzheimer's. And movie mashup. Barbie plus Oppenheimer. What's going on? Equals Barbenheimer? I thought I might stay over tonight. Why? I'm actually not sure. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. An eerie silence blanketed Canada's largest port today. And with it, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of product at a standstill at the Port of Vancouver, where a back and forth labor dispute is disrupting operations for a third straight week. Good evening, and thanks for joining us. After a deal was thought to be in the books last week, uncertainty is once again muddying the waters of labor negotiations in British Columbia. The union leaders representing port workers rejected a federal mediator settlement that could have put an end to the 13-day work stoppage. This morning, workers reissued a 72-hour strike notice after a new walkout was deemed illegal. Then, late this afternoon, that notice was removed. Now, it's not clear why. More details will come out of a union meeting tonight. Our Neetu Garcha is at the Port of Vancouver for us. Neetu. Farah, BC's Premier David Eby said federal legislation is not the solution at this stage and called on Ottawa to help get the two sides back to the bargaining table. But stakeholders, including business groups, are saying the opposite and demanding for Ottawa to bring this strike to an immediate end. This empty lot, another twist in the B.C. port strike going back and forth. Pickets came down and strike action stopped again. Last week, many thought the nearly two-week-long strike was about to end until Tuesday when the union rejected the tentatively agreed-upon contract. With every day that the, the port is disrupted, it takes several days to recover. On Tuesday morning, the resumed strike action came to a halt after the Labour Minister announced a ruling for the union to cease and desist from participating in any strike action because it did not provide 72-hour strike notice and called the job action illegal. The economic impact of this, this uh, dispute is about $800 million a day. Uh, so significant impact on the Canadian economy. Really, a third of North America, Canada's non-North American trade goes through the port of Vancouver every day. The employer said the union then doubled down and issued another 72-hour strike notice, which was removed just hours later. The reaction from political leaders was swift. My patience, personal patience, has run out. We really have a responsibility to act. We should produce as much as we can right here in Canada, right here in Ontario, until we don't have uh, these, these issues. Justin Trudeau must do his job and end this strike immediately because of the massive cost to workers, consumers and businesses. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business says 70 percent of small businesses in B.C. have been impacted by the job action and a majority of businesses across Canada feel Ottawa needs to end the strike. Uh, we do feel that back to work legislation is now the only option that the federal government may be left with. The union says it's been an illegal strike position since July 1st and only suspended picketing at the request of the Labour Minister and hopes to return to the bargaining table to negotiate fair compensation and protection for workers' job security. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. After months of uncertainty, the province of BC is ordering the city of Surrey to transition to a municipal police service and to abandon plans to revert to the RCMP. BC Solicitor General and Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth says the decision is final. The debate over policing in Surrey has been highly charged and divisive. I know that this is an extraordinary use of my powers under the Police Act, and I did not make this decision lightly. Farnworth is also promising to introduce legislation in the fall to help ensure similar policing sagas don't happen again. Surrey Mayor Brenda Locke calls the ruling misguided, based on inaccurate assumptions and an undermining of a local government. 
More help is on the way for firefighters battling the more than 370 active wildfires in British Columbia. Provincial officials say 75 more military personnel are heading to Burns Lake in northern B.C. and they're going to join 75 others who are already in the region as part of federal government aid. North of Cranbrook, at least six homes have been destroyed and dozens more evacuated after a wildfire sparked Monday tripled in size. And in Europe, some residents have joined the firefight in parts of Greece as raging wildfires spread northwest of Athens. Hundreds of firefighters and multiple water bombers have been sent from around the continent to help tackle several wildfires. Thousands have been told to flee with several homes already destroyed. Scorching heat is gripping southern Europe with temperatures in many cities reaching record highs on Tuesday. In Ukraine, it was a hellish night of attacks in and around the southern port city of Odessa for a second straight day since Russia pulled out of that grain deal. Ukraine's Air Force says Russia launched 31 missiles and 32 drones overnight. According to Ukraine, Russia destroyed 60,000 tons of grain meant for export. The Kremlin says ships bound for Ukraine will also be considered as hostile. Here's Crystal Gamansing. Unverified videos on social media captured a massive explosion reportedly in the port city. Russia says it hit military and industrial facilities around Odessa with precision strikes launched by air and sea. No military hardware here, just Elizaveta's bedroom, now littered with glass and debris. We heard the first explosion, then the siren. We quickly moved to the corridor to be between two walls. Ukraine says six cruise missiles were fired towards Odessa from the Black Sea, but claim all were intercepted. Officials say they also took down 31 drones Tuesday night into Wednesday. Russia is deliberately targeting civilian infrastructure, living quarters and our port, said the Ukrainian president, adding the attack on the port threatens global security because so many rely on Ukraine's agricultural exports, the future of which is in limbo after Russia pulled out of the deal ensuring Ukrainian grain transports through the Black Sea. Russians, meanwhile, living in occupied Crimea, were also dealing with the aftermath of strikes. Smoke was seen billowing from an area said to be a military training base. Roughly 2,000 people were sent to an evacuation center. I'm lying down, 4 a.m., an explosion, a flash of light. Five minutes later, another flash of light. And then the bombings, says this man, who was about two kilometers away from the base. Russia has controlled Crimea since 2014 when it illegally annexed the Ukrainian peninsula, now using it as a military staging point. The Kremlin says the strikes are retaliation for an attack Monday on the bridge linking Russia and Crimea. So more strikes on southern Ukraine are likely. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. In the U.S., there are more signs of just how deep efforts were to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Authorities in Michigan have charged 16 Republicans in a scheme to falsely certify Donald Trump as the winner. And the walls are closing in on the former president as well, who could face charges over his efforts to cling to power. But as Jackson Prosco reports, remarkably, none of it seems to be hurting Trump's push for a new term. Back on the campaign trail, the former president previewed his legal strategy, deflect and deny. We have prosecutors that are evil people. These are evil people, deranged. Though Donald Trump claims his looming prosecution is politically motivated, his attempts to overturn the 2020 election are no secret. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. From his words on January 6, 2021, to behind-the-scenes efforts to sway state election officials, many of whom have already given evidence to a grand jury convened by special counsel Jack Smith. They have to show that he actually knew that he lost the election. It has to be shown that he had the requisite intent to, to try to impede the transfer of power when he knew, in fact, that the election had been lost. How do you feel? Reports suggest Trump is likely to be charged with deprivation of rights, 
conspiracy and witness tampering, just as other election-related prosecutions are gaining steam. In Michigan, officials have charged 16 Republicans who falsely signed paperwork claiming Trump won the state in 2020 when he in fact lost. This plan to reject the will of the voters and undermine democracy was fraudulent and legally baseless. Trump is the most important target for prosecutors, making him a martyr for Republicans. He's still far and away the front runner for the party's presidential nomination, but in the eyes of the general public, his legal woes may leave him a damaged candidate. Many Americans think that these indictments disqualify Trump for the presidency. As we see the accumulation of bad news, we're likely to see um, his, his popular support continue to erode. All of it offers a window into another part of Trump's legal strategy, delay. In the Florida documents case, Trump's lawyers have asked for the trial to be postponed until after the November 2024 election. If Trump is indicted again, expect more of the same. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Summer in Canada usually means time off for vacations, beaches and barbecues. But for political parties vying for your vote, times have changed. Even when there's no election looming, politicians are in constant campaign mode. And they're spending big bucks on digital strategies to stay in your feed and get to know you. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, reports. On our screens, tablets and phones, $1,500 in a month yeah. on grocery bills. This is Camp Adadzi in Latvia. These days, the digital political campaign never stops. Oh, amazing. Yes, we love long-term yes. care workers. Maintaining that touch point on these social media platforms, constantly testing and making sure that your audience is true um, will be something that needs to be done on a consistent basis. You're out there looking for supporters, first of all, yeah. and once you ID them that they're supporting you, then you try to move them up the ladder. Can they give money? Can they give time? Political campaigns gather names, phone numbers, postal codes, the building blocks of a voter database. Then they take that to social networks like Facebook for micro-targeted campaigns to find even more supporters. Our ability to really match what we're seeing in public opinion directly to the criteria that we know were granted on these platforms makes it extremely efficient to talk to the right people. Even their opponents concede that the Liberals are doing best right now at digital campaigns. The Liberals are the, you know, the reigning champ, if you will, when it comes to this, but they are getting old and tired. Can Justin Trudeau recapture some of that magic, um, you know, eight years into his mandate? And, and what is he doing to attract new people? Can Pierre Poilievre translate some of that Twitter aggressiveness that he's so good at, that he's perfected, into something that's a little bit softer, perhaps, to attract more middle-of-the-road audiences? Dave Summer once worked in Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's office running liberal digital campaigns. People who will have success at the next election are the ones who are doing something a little bit different than they're doing now. The big liberal advantage is partly based on the digital reach of its leader, Justin Trudeau. His Facebook page, for example, is followed by 8.5 million people. The pages of Pierre Poiliev and Jagmeet Singh have about a million followers combined. That said, all parties are constantly testing new digital techniques and content is more important than ever. Poliev is now telling a story. So you're seeing he may not have the same reach. Now I would say his reach is actually quite large, but he is telling a narrative that is reaching a certain uh, segment of the population. Political data and analytics is already very sophisticated, but the future is on the horizon with artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT that will make collecting political data cheaper and even more precise. Farah. David Aiken in Ottawa. Thank you for that, David detecting a devastating brain disease. Coming up, how artificial intelligence could be a critical tool in diagnosing Alzheimer's. An Alzheimer's diagnosis is devastating for any family. And while there's no cure, an early diagnosis can make a difference in managing symptoms and planning for the future. New technology using artificial intelligence is offering hope for detecting the disease earlier than ever before. Catherine Ward explains. Well, it's an honor to care for people you love, and it, it's hard, and you, you, you know, end that journey with some scars that stay with you. Dr. Sharon Cohen knows firsthand how difficult it can be to see the people you love slowly slip away. They developed Alzheimer's disease when I was already a neurologist, uh, 
studying dementia care. Her father, Martin, was a mathematician and loved to play the piano. Her mother, Donya, an author and passionate poet. There's nothing nice about Alzheimer's. Um, and I, I think of them a lot, even though it's too late for them. I feel like they would be thrilled to know there's something for next generations. The disease is tricky. It's complex. Come on forward. But a new technology is showing significant promise. The goal is to get ahead of a diagnosis, and optometrists may have a key role to play. My role in this has been to help screen patients, especially the patients over the age of 55 who have some kind of memory loss or memory changes. The process will be familiar to most of us, just like having your eyes checked, a flash, a few pictures, and the results are ready to be analyzed. An AI algorithm reads and analyzes the scans. The results are shared with family doctors who help patients understand them. So if we look at the back of the eye, we're able to see the front part of the brain and we can look for these biomarkers and changes that may be occurring in the brain. The biomarker is a protein. It is the first measurable sign of the disease. So no clinician can look in the back of your eye and determine if you have the signs of Alzheimer's disease. But with the special sensor that we use and the algorithm, we're able to, with very strong reliability, uh, determine who does and does not have that protein. The hope is for patients to also talk about changes in their memory with their eye doctor. And one. The technology is not widely available and still needs approval from Health Canada. Developers say they would like to see it rolled out by 2025. Doctors say it's an encouraging step forward for a disease that has already taken so much. This provides huge hope for people that we're not just trying to patch up symptoms. We're getting at the underlying disease. We can slow it down. We can keep people functioning longer, keep them milder in the community with their families, keep people with mild cognitive impairment uh, at that stage longer rather than having them progress to dementia. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. Fighting for rights in Afghanistan, ahead the rare protests over a ruling from the Taliban. Dozens of women in Afghanistan staged a rare protest today after the Taliban ordered the closure of beauty salons across the country. Security forces used tasers and water cannon to break up the demonstration. The Taliban says it's outlawing salons because the services they provide are forbidden by Islam. It is the latest attack on the rights of women and girls in the country since the Taliban returned to power two years ago. A third round of violent clashes have erupted in Kenya as protesters demand the government lower the cost of living. Several people have been shot by security forces. The opposition has called for three days of countrywide demonstrations to try and force the president to repeal his new finance act and tax on housing and fuel that has effectively pumped up the price of gas to its highest ever level. Box office battle. Next, the bizarre summer showdown between two blockbusters. FIFA officially kicks off the Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand tomorrow. And here at home, excitement is building for Team Canada's first match against Nigeria tomorrow night. Canada's ranked seventh in the world, but after winning gold at the Tokyo Olympics two years ago, Hopes are high. According to new exclusive polling for Global News, 14% of Canadians believe the team will actually win the World Cup. And there's another summer showdown on the horizon. Two of this year's biggest movies hit theaters this week, and they couldn't be more different. One is the story of a children's toy come to life, while the other is about the creator of the atomic bomb. But as Mike Armstrong explains, somehow the blockbusters have been linked in a way unlike anything we've seen in the film industry. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. The battle at the box office this weekend will be waged between a blonde bombshell. Hi, Ken. And a brown-haired bomb maker. I have a 12-month head start. 18. How could you possibly know that? Somehow, the two movies have been linked by harnessing the power of juxtaposition. There's something strange about putting them together. But people are. What's going on? I'm actually not sure. 
This is one of the mashup trailers, taking Barbie, adding Oppenheimer, and getting Barbenheimer. Barbie Oppenheimer Day is fast approaching. How will you be celebrating? Basically, ever since it was announced, the two movies would be released on the same day. And going head to head, people have been having fun with it. The Barbie movie is a light comedy. This is a matter of life and death. Oppenheimer about as heavy a drama as possible. I don't have anything big planned, just becoming death, the destroyer of worlds. You should stop by. So cool. Well, together, they have trailers, movie posters, and t-shirts. People are showing up with them on the red carpet. <laughs> okay, I have to sign it on this side. I hope you meet Killian Murphy and he can sign the other side. Now it is something the casts of the two movies, seemingly half of Hollywood by the way, are enjoying. Marketing experts say both will likely get a boost at the box office from all the publicity. World. Some theaters are promoting a double bill. But well, remember this day. Both movies back to back, which raises an interesting question. Barbie or Oppenheimer? Which one do you think I'll prefer? No, I mean, which one do you want to watch first? I think the world maybe wants to see Barbie a little bit more right now. I think actually start your day with Barbie, then go straight into Oppenheimer and then Barbie Chaser. Why are these men looking at me? There is one theater chain offering a discount for people who see both, but warning against going back to back. It's not just that they'd run a combined five hours. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. The company says the sudden change in subject matter might lead to a sort of cinematic whiplash. Mike Armstrong, Global News. I like the Barbie chaser idea. That's Global National for this Wednesday night. I'm Farah Nasser. On behalf of our whole crew, I want to thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. And tonight's Your Canada is the Devil's Punch Bowl in Spruce Woods Provincial Park in Manitoba. We love seeing Your Canada. Please keep emailing us your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night.